Now let's continue on in Gospel of John, chapter 5. And let's learn the lessons we need to learn. See, because God's way is not a religion. It's a way of life. It's a way of love. It's a way of truth. And in this life, we need to learn it so that when we enter into the kingdom of God and are transformed from flesh into spirit, and God gives us whatever work he wants us to do in his kingdom, okay, that it will be based on the right thing, which is the love of God. And in the Gospel of John, he tells us how much he loves us. Now, you see, in the world today, the problem is that a lot of people like to play religion. They like to say, oh, well, we belong to a church, and we're faithful in our Sunday keeping, and we have the greatest time with all the holidays, etc., and they don't even understand how far removed from God that they really are. Now, we know that, but what we need to do is not only know that, we need to know what we need to do. And here is the thing that we need to pray about every single day. Let's come to Matthew 22. Okay? Matthew 22 and verse 36. And what this is, what is the greatest thing that we can do toward God and for God and for ourselves? Okay. What is the greatest thing that he wants us to do toward him? Okay. Let's read it. And there was a doctor of the law. He asked the question, verse 36, Master, which commandment is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And Mark 12 adds, to it with all your strength. See? That's the key most important thing that there is. See? It's not a matter of wisdom. It's not a matter of how much you know. It's a matter, do you really love God? See, in the world, they like to claim the love of God and say it's unconditional. God is saying, and we'll see a little later, it is conditional. That's why we need to pray about it every day, brethren, every one of us, because we're looking at some tough times coming down the road, and we're going to be looking at things that are difficult to understand. And problems will come into our lives that we will think, oh, why is this so bad? Well, Remember what Jesus went through. And he went through it because he loved God. So likewise with us. See? And this Feast of Tabernacles helps us all to draw close together, and we'll talk about loving each other in a little bit, because that's also necessary. But how can we love each other if we don't love God first? Now back to John 5, verse 16, John 5, okay? Because the man went and told the Jews that Jesus was the one who healed him. And for this cause, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him. Now you need to understand that. Remember what Jesus said? There's coming the day 
that they will think they're doing God's business when they kill you. Okay? And that day's coming because of the hatred of the world, the hatred of Satan the devil. So to more to kill him, not only because he loosed the Sabbath, he didn't break it. King James translating that that way is completely misunderstanding the Bible. But also because he called God his own father, making himself equal with God. Well, if you're the son of God, you are equal with God after the resurrection. See? Therefore, Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son has no power to do anything of himself. Same way with us. We need to learn to trust God. We need to learn to rely on God. We need to love God, all of those things, so that whatever we do, we do in the name of God and we do it right in a way that's helpful, in a way that's good. Okay. Now this also means, this also means that as the son, he had no power to do anything of his own, okay? also tells us the same thing. Christ relied totally on God the Father. We rely totally on God the Father and Jesus Christ. Now notice what he says, but only what he sees the Father do. So there was communication between Jesus and the Father. Sees the Father do. For whatever he does, these things the Son does in the same manner. For the Father loves the Son. Think about that. That's why we have to love God first. And shows him everything that he himself is doing. Now think about this. How much God has shown his people and for each one of us because we love God. Huh? That's quite a thing to understand. He shows us what he's doing. And is not the Feast of Tabernacles and what's going to happen at that time? Is that not what God wants done? And we become an integral part of it as the sons and daughters of God? Yes, indeed. And he will show them greater works than these so that you may be filled with wonder. For even as the Father raises the dead and gives life, in the same way also the Son gives life to whom he will. Now that's quite a thing, isn't it? That's why every day, not my will be done, but your will, God. See, right? That's all part of loving God. Okay. For the Father judges no one, but he's com committed all judgment to the Son. Why? Because he took on flesh and became a human being, and he knows what it's like. He's been tested in every point just exactly as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4. See? He understands what it's like to be under temptation. He understands what it's like to suffer through the difficult times, okay? That's why he's been given all judgment. So that all may honor the Son even as they honor the Father. The one who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Quite an interesting thing. Now we're going to see some very important points here that are absolutely essential, okay? And this is what we are going to be teaching the brethren. And why I'm going through all of these things is so that we, during this Feast of Tabernacles, and after we leave here and go home, we'll have a closer relationship with God 
so that we can attain to what God wants us to do. That's the whole purpose of it. And that we can all attain to the first resurrection and serve God in serving the people during the millennium and think about serving them during the great white throne judgment. What a great thing that is going to be. Okay. Verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, the one who hears my word and believes him who sent me has everlasting life and does not come into judgment, for he has passed from death to life. That means you have to have been repented, baptized, received the Holy Spirit, growing in grace and knowledge, living in the love of God, loving God yourself, God loving you, all of that. That's what God wants. We don't come into judgment or condemnation, but the resurrection, which is life. Verse 25, truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear shall live. All the dead. Now that shows you the great power of God. All the dead, again, past, present, and future, right? Yes. For even as the Father has life in himself, so is he also given to the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Now that's telling those scribes and Pharisees and priests an awful lot. Here they are standing there, condemning him, wanting to kill him. And here's what he's telling them. He's telling them he's the Messiah and he is here doing the will of God and you hate him. Now verse 28. Do not wonder at this, for the hour is coming which all who are in the grave shall hear his voice, and they shall come forth, those who have done good unto a resurrection of life. The good that we do is the good of God. Not good that we think is good and try and make it the word of God will be resurrected to life. Now that's eternal life. Okay. Now notice the next part. And those who have practiced evil unto a resurrection of judgment. All right. This has two categories. The second resurrection They've lived their life in sin, have not had their sins forgiven, but they haven't committed the unpardonable sin. They'll be raised to a physical life for an opportunity for salvation. The second part of this is the incorrigible wicked who have committed the unpardonable sin and they will have the judgment given to them and they will be cast into the lake of fire. Okay. So there's an awful lot here that's in the Gospel of John. Okay. Verse 30. I have no power to do anything of myself. Okay. Now, of means ek. He had nothing that he could initiate from his own personal being. No power to do anything. See, because unless what Jesus is doing is with the power of God, so that in turn, those that receive that will be able to enter into the kingdom of God. Does nothing on his own. But as I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just 
because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Now that's quite a thing, isn't it? The will of the Father who sent me. Now, think about our daily prayer. Remember there, Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 12? How does it start out? He said, when you pray, you say, Our Father, who's in heaven, holy is your name. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now that means in your daily life. Okay? That's why daily prayer is so important. And daily prayer helps us to understand not to live our own lives with our own will, but use our will power and free moral agency to choose God's way, to love God his way, to do things his way, see? That's what he's talking about here, okay? Verse 37, and the Father himself, a personal, himself, from God, who sent me, has borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice nor seen his form at any time. So we know that this is also a proof that the Lord God of the Old Testament was Jesus Christ and not the Father. Okay. Verse 38, here's a key. Very important thing okay. for us as well. Think about this. Ask ourselves the question, do we do this the way that God wants or not? Verse 38, you do not have his word dwelling in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. Now think about that for a minute. What is the new covenant? To have it written in our hearts and our minds, and if it's written in there, then we believe it, right? And we believe it unto salvation, unto the resurrection, so that we can be there with Christ and save the world. Isn't that interesting? In order for God to save the world, he's got to have all of those in the first resurrection there to help him do it. Now, how important is that? All right. So he tells them, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are the ones that testify of me. And there are 356 places in the Old Testament that refer to Jesus Christ. Maybe even more. Okay? But you are unwilling to come to me that you may have life. Now remember, the only way you have life, the only way you have truth, is through Jesus Christ. Right? We'll see that in a little bit. Won't well, come to me that you live. Then he says this, verse 41, very important verse for us. Because in the days that we are living in, with the way it's going to be coming down, we have got to be spiritually strong with God's spirit, with God's word in us, with resoluteness, with determination with love and faith and belief, see? Okay. Verse 41, I do not receive glory from men. Look what happened when the church did that. Huh? What happened? How did God correct it? It no longer exists. How's that for correction? See? 
Then he makes quite a statement here. And this tells you how much God knows about us, our intentions, our thoughts, our attitudes and everything, and also what we'll be able to know about those that we are teaching and helping. See? It's going to be quite a thing. That's why we need to learn of Jesus now and think about it in the future when we're going to be in the great feast of tabernacles when Christ returns. Verse 42. Now, this was a problem within the church, right? If it wasn't a problem within the church, then why did God destroy it? Huh? But I have known you that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. Do we? Remember where we started? Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and being. See, they devolved everything down into a religion and work and traditions of men. They didn't love God. They loved themselves. They loved their friends. They loved their works and their traditions. Like one man who conversed with a rabbi, and he told him. This was Roy Asante, our office manager in Australia. And he was talking to this rabbi, and he said, if you didn't have all of these traditions, you and I would believe virtually the same. And his answer was, if we don't have our traditions, we have nothing. Now think about that. That's quite a statement. You don't have God. You don't have the love of God. Because you cling to your tradition. Take and apply the same thing. Protestants, Catholics, independents, whatever. Okay. Now notice verse 43. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. But if another comes in his name, you will receive him. How are you able to believe you who receive glory from one another? Think about that in relationship to our teaching the brethren during the millennium. How are they going to be able to believe unless we're teaching them the things of God and the will of God and the love of God and the truth of God? Okay? And do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. Okay? Now notice what he said. And what a complete, how shall we say, spiritual dagger in the heart. Okay? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, even Moses, in whom you have hope. Everything was Moses, 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 right? But if you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. And if you do not believe his writings, how shall you believe my words? Got to have the whole Bible, right? Okay, let's go on. Chapter 6 and verse 57. This is what we're going to be teaching, and this is what we need to be doing now. And the point I, I want us to all understand is that what we do now is going to affect what it will be then. See? Verse 57. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father. Okay? That's what he did. Completely. So also the one who eats me shall live by me, referring to the Passover. Okay. 
live by God. Everything. Now let's come to chapter 12. Okay. Verse 47. John 12, verse 47. But if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has one that judges him, the word that I have spoken that will judge him at the last day. He made it clear. I'm not here on my own. These are not things that I've thought of of myself, but these are from the Father. And he made it very clear. Verse 49. For I have not spoken from myself, but the Father who sent me gave me commandment himself, direct from God. Okay. What I should do and what I should speak. Same way with us today. And this is what we need to understand. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, whatever I speak, I speak exactly as the Father has told me, because there's no other way to receive eternal life. Okay? Very important. Okay? Okay, now let's come to John 14. John 14, and let's pick it up here in verse 2. Now, we know this is on the Passover night, but this is talking about what's going to happen in the millennium. Okay? In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were otherwise, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now think about that relationship to how you live your life, how you serve the brethren, what you do in your life, how you pray, how you study, everything that you do. See? God is preparing a place for us. A place. Now think about how good that's going to be. Okay? On the last great day, we're going to cover about New Jerusalem. That sounds like a pretty great place to live, right? All right. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. Okay? And of course, then he said here, verse 6, and this is what we need to learn now. And this is what all the brethren, all the elders, everything about it. Whenever we try and do something that looks good, but is not defined as something we should do, that's going to lead to trouble. Okay? Verse 6, Jesus said, I'm the way. There's no other way. And the truth. And the more you study the word of God and the more you understand the truth that's in it, the more that you're going to understand what's in there for us. Okay. And the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So no one's going to come to the Father unless it's done God's way. Okay? Then he says over here, he makes it very clear. Okay? Let's pick it up in verse 21. I know we cover this on Passover. I know that we cover it at other times, but I want you to think of it in terms of the Feast of Tabernacles are keeping it now, the Feast of Tabernacles for each one of us individually coming into the kingdom of God. Okay. And so that we can really yield ourselves to God. 
and how important it is and how we never, never, never want to lose this. Pick it up here, verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, now anyone, that's anyone, love God, love Christ. How do you love Christ? By doing what he says, by believing what he's teaching, by loving him, loving the brethren. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Now that's something to really sink your mind into. That with the Spirit of God, you have the Spirit of Christ for the mind of Christ, and we have the Spirit of Father, which is the begettle for eternal life. Okay? Make our abode. Dwell with us. That's what's in us now. So let's use that. Let's use that. Let's every day drink in of it. Through study, through prayer, through yieldedness to God. Okay. Let's come here to chapter 15. Let's see how we can do this. Okay. Let's pick it up here. In verse 4, after he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, my father is the husbandman. Verse 4, dwell in me, and I in you. So here we have the father dwelling in us, Christ dwelling in us, and working both ways. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but only if it remains in the vine, Neither can you bear fruit unless you are dwelling in me. And we add, and Christ and the Father are dwelling in us. See? I am the vine and you are the branches. If you're dwelling in me and I in him, that one bears much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. That is, Nothing of a lasting spiritual nature. You may be able to do some things, but they're not in accord with God. And if they're not in accord with God and Jesus and the Word of God, then why are we doing it? Now notice he gives a warning. And his warning is given so that we will remain in Christ. If anyone does not dwell in me, he is cast out as a branch and is dried up, and men gather them and cast them into a fire, and they are burned. That's going to be true. Verse 7, If you dwell in me and my words dwell in you, notice, you're dwelling in him and his words in you. You shall ask whatever you desire, and it shall come to pass for you. God will answer your prayers. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is yes, but. Other times the answer is yes, perfectly. Okay. In this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Now think about that in the millennium. And God gives us our assignments, and we know what we're doing, and we're practicing the things of God, teaching the things of God, bearing much fruit. Think of the fruit that's going to come during that time, and think about how it's going to be and those now entering into the kingdom of God during the millennium. What a great joy that's going to be. Satan is nowhere around. The only problem with sin that we will have is 
the law of sin and death will still be in the human beings. And there will be some, as we'll find out tomorrow, who will not want to do what God wants. And we'll find out what happens with them. In this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Now notice this. Here's what we want. Here's what we need to rely on. And this is what we're going to teach during the millennium, see? It's going to be so totally different from anything we have knowledge of today that there's no comparison, okay? Here it is. As the Father has loved me. Now that's perfect love, right? Yes. I also have loved you. Now notice what he says. He says, live in my love, which comes from the Father, right? And how is that expressed? The first visible way that is expressed is verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall live in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and live in his love. Now that's what God wants. See? And that's what the whole millennium is going to be based upon. Love, truth, righteousness, goodness, joy, all the wondrous things of God, things we can't even imagine that will be done and can be done because God is going to be glorified. Christ is going to be glorified. God's plan that was from before the ages of time is going to unfold and become greater and greater and greater. Okay? Now, Ephesians, the first chapter. This is quite a thing, okay? Ephesians, the first chapter. Now, here in the first chapter, this tells us how much God is involved in our lives and how we need to respond to God, which then in turn will help us be more converted, more loving, more yielded, more doing the will of God, which in turn at the resurrection will give us the ability to really help the brethren and help the people. Okay? This is something. The whole first chapter, well, now we don't have time to go through the whole first chapter, but so that we understand what God is doing. Now notice how Paul begins. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who were in Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. That's out way beyond time and space down to our day, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And may that be with us during this Feast of Tabernacles. May this be the greatest feast that we have ever had. Okay? Spiritually speaking. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly things with Christ. That is a prophecy of things in the future, but the heavenly things are the Holy Spirit of God, the truth of God, the love of God, and all of that that we have now. Now notice this. I want you to think about this. You look around and see each one of us, okay? And God is the one who has done it. Think about it. According as he has personally chosen us, who first draws us? The Father, right? Who teaches us? God. How does he teach us? With his word and with his spirit. Who has personally chosen us 
before the foundation of the world. That is, those that he chooses, he has the plan worked out before the foundation of the world. Okay. In order that we might be holy and blameless before him in love. What a thing that is. Having predestined us to sonship. That's why we're here. That's why we're in the church. That's why we keep the Sabbath and the holy days and the Passover and love each other and do the things that we need to do. See, that's why, because God loves us, because God has chosen us so that we will be there in the kingdom of God to teach the rest of the world, okay? Having predestinated us for sonship to himself, through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his own will. All right? Come down here to verse 13. Okay? This shows us what we need to be doing. In whom you also trusted, after hearing the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after hearing you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's what we are here to do today, to stir up the Spirit of God in you, to help you have a broad, big picture of what God is doing and how he is doing it, see. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So we'll close with these next few verses because this is the inspiration of God being revealed to us. Now verse 15. For this cause, for the whole cause of everything of what God is doing, and we're here for the cause of the millennium. We're here for the cause of learning to grow in grace and knowledge. We're here because we love God. We're here because we love each other. See? I also, after hearing of the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ that is among you, and with the love toward all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now here is the key. This is what we need to learn from this day, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you. This is what God wants to give to us. The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And that the eyes of your mind may be enlightened. That is to understand, see? In order that you may comprehend what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the inner working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead? So brethren, on this fifth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Let's understand how much that we can grow in grace and knowledge and understanding by loving God and doing the will of God, by being faithful, by yielding to God, by continually going forward, by continually yielding to him. So we'll close for now and have an enjoyable time after services.